Um, I will start the screen sharing right now. Um, but I should perhaps tell you that what you're going to see first is a black screen. So don't uh, be surprised if you see that black screen. Um, but I'm showing that black screen because um, I want the quote that's going to come up right now uh, to be all the more visible. It's a quote uh, by Walter Benjamin, who visited Soviet Russia from December 1926 to February 1927. And he was so impressed by what he saw that it led him to question some of the ways in which he and his fellow Europeans were accustomed to view their place in the world. What did he write uh, in an essay about this visit to Moscow? Uh, he wrote the following. All the Europeans ought to see on a map of Russia, the little country, countries as afraid, nervous territory far out to the west. I would like to start from this short note in his Moscow diaries. Um, and here in my office, as you can see behind me, I've taken this injunction quite literally. I have a map, map of Russia behind me. And Europe does appear as a little marginal appendix to that map. And I'll, I'll try, try and show it to you. You know, it's, it, it's up there somewhere, you know, hardly, hardly visible, very distorted. And I'm afraid, nervous territory. Um, and in this talk, what I'd like to do is I'd like to explore how we can arrive at such a shift as perspective that um, Walter Benjamin had also in urban studies and it, it's in its quest to become more global, to move towards a global uh, urbanism, a gl more global urban theory. And some of you might have come across um, this quote by, um, by Walter Benjamin uh, because it appears in Jennifer Robinson's 2006 book, Ordinary Cities. But the promise of viewing global cities from Russia or from the East more generally has remained unredeemed so far. And thinking cities with the East remains an unfinished project. I would even say it's a project that has barely started. And I think we should push for it to advance. Well, this the thesis that it's go going to carry through the talk. Um, and the, the, the main hypothesis that I would like to put forward is that thinking with the East, with the global East, allows us to think cities beyond North and South. And hence the title of this talk, Thinking Cities Beyond North and South. And it's probably an argument that could be made not just for cities, but for many kinds of research objects, whether it's society, social practices, political systems, cultural institutions, envir environmental actions, and so on. Uh, but I will make it for cities because this is uh, uh, the, the field that I know, I know best and that I've done my research in. I will, for large parts, uh, speak off script, um, simply because I think it makes it easy, easier to listen to via Zoom. So I might make some mistakes, I might do, uh, have some repetitions, but uh, uh, the idea is really to, for you to have a, a listening experience that, you know, in, in 40 minutes, it's easy to take off and go to Google and do something else. Um, I will hope I'll make it interesting enough for you to, to avoid that experience. And I'd like to start with a simple question. Uh, does the East exist in global urban theory? A question is perhaps a little deceptively simple because there are two important terms here that will um, reappear through the rest of my talk today. Um, the first one is the East, which here stands as a shorthand for uh, the global East. An epistemic project um, that seeks to um, become a concept of rethinking uh, the divisions uh, and the hemispheric binaries of global theory. And when I say it's an epistemic concept, um, I'm inspired by what Brian Masumi wrote about what a concept could be. He said a concept could be um, a brick, and with brick you can do two things. Uh, you can either build the courthouse of reason, as he says it, or you can throw it through the window. So I think we need to do both with this brick of the global East. I think first we need to throw it through the window of global urban theory to then take it and rebuild a more global urban theory with it. And then there's the second term here, global urban theory. Um, when I use the term, um, I use it to refer to a way of theorizing that takes inspiration uh, from thinkers and from places around the globe. So it's therefore not global in the sense of being universal, but it's precisely the opposite. It's global, that kind of urban theory becomes global in diversifying the sources of inspiration beyond a few Western thinkers. And if you look into the literature in global urban theory, you might get the impression that the East might as well not exist, or at the very least, its presence is sparse and erratic. 
And I've made that argument in the past, and so have a couple of colleagues. So I will not rehearse it here in depth, but it does form the starting point of the talk here today. So I do want to go into one concept that I've used uh, to point out uh, the problem of the non-existing Eastern global urban theory. And that is the concept of the hemispheric fallacy. The hemispheric fallacy is basically to say, if you take the global north and you take the global south and you put the two together, you get the world, you get global theory. Um, and that makes, of course, sense if you think of north and south in geometrical terms um, as two hemispheres, two half spheres. Of course, then when you put them together, you do have the world. Um, and in one of the original propositions of the concepts of north and south uh, in the so-called Brunt report, um, that was exactly the case. You know, there's the, the famous Brunt line that you see here, um, cutting the world into two halves. Um, and one of the ideas of proposing this, um, these hemispheric binaries of North and South was precisely to say in, in a period I mean, that, that happened in the 1970s, 1980s, um, in a period of intense West-East conflict was precisely to say, well, actually the real divisions are not ideological um, between East and West. They are um, material economic between the rich North and the poor South. But of course, this inherited dichotomy, um, uh, this hemispheric fallacy leads to an array of all those cities that are uncomfortably located somewhere between or beyond North and South. Uh, cities like Belgrade or Kiev, like Istanbul and Taipei, like Astana and Beijing, or like Moscow and Seoul, or like Prague, obviously. Cities that are not particularly rich nor particularly poor, cities that are not in former European empires or only partly, but not in former European colonies either. In short, cities that are not quite in the north, but not quite in the south either, but in this in-between space. Um, and I use the east usually in the plural. Um, and today I'll talk about the one east that I know best, which is broadly um, the east of the former socialist countries. But much of the argument can also be developed for other easts. And when I use east in the plural, I refer to all those places that are outside the privileged relationship of North and South of former European empires and um, their previous colonies. But for um, the East that I'll be talking about today, this hemispheric fallacy has led to a silence about its urban experience. The East is missing in global urban theory. Um, and that is uh, worth remarking. It is worth remarking because global urban theory, um, like many um, other domains of social and cultural theory globally has seen a move towards decentering um, theories, uh, towards theorizing from outside the center, the center here being uh, Western Europe and North, and North, North America. Um, this has been known also as the decolonial movement, um, although I'm somewhat skeptical of the term decolonial, um, uh, because it, it does connotate, it does send us back to this north-south north dichotomy, I, I would argue. Um, and the term Eurocentrism, um, as much as I agree with the idea of decentering, um, of course, Eurocentrism um, references a Europe that is very divided. Um, and what often is referenced in Eurocentrism is, of course, Western Europe, um, because Eastern Europe probably falls on the other side of Eurocentrism. So uh, there could be an interesting debate that we could have about terms like decolonial Eurocentrism that in my uh, view would uh, connotate very important projects of decentering, but by, by using those very terms also draw certain geographical Im imaginations of places that are included in those projects and places that are excluded in those projects. I use a more positive formulation, perhaps, not the decentering, not the decolonizing, but I use the idea of uh, moving towards a global urban theory um, in, in, in that place. And so some of you might be familiar with some of the, the books that have come out on this, uh, different from, from different language backgrounds, different disciplines, different world regions, um, none actually um, from the former socialist East, which is interesting in itself. Um, and which begs some reflection why that is the case. And one could make the argument that um, the political um, and economic collapse of state socialism led also to some sort of epistemic collapse. An epistemic collapse, at least in the external perception of theory um, coming from the East um, and being received, read or not read um, in um, the global North. 
because uh, just just to make that argument a little more evident, um, what one could do is is to kind of a uh, before after comparison. You could have somebody like Frederick Jameson uh, um, in 1988 write that conditions for radically differential space might be found in the second and third worlds that make possible projects and constructions that are not possible in the first. So here, in one breath, in one sentence, um, he evokes the possibility for alternatives for radically differential space um, in both the second and the third world. Now, after 1989 to 1991, so the successive uh, dissolution of, of state socialism, um, this perception changes in, uh, in, uh, in the global north. Uh, and you have somebody like Nancy Fraser saying, at the collapse of communism in 1989, it's not simply the delegitimation of the Soviet Union in formerly existing institutional socialisms, rather there's been a large crisis of confidence and crisis of vision on the left. So um, the, this, this um, dissolution, and I would say that the use of the term collapse in itself is actually very heavily normatively loaded, um, so let's, let's call it dissolution, um, was uh, what was um, um, not just an economic and a political um, uh, act with economic and political consequences, um, but also uh, led to a large crisis of confidence, a crisis of vision on the left, um, which devalidated also theory and inspiration coming from that part of the world. Or perhaps uh, another way of thinking this uh, is uh, by Gaia Trispivak, who in an interview said that over the last 10 years or so, um, I've become very interested in the question, can there be a socialist ethics? This course has changed shape, its shape since the dissolution of the Soviet Union. So I was very curious when I read that interview, how has that course changed shape? And of course, in her sometimes very opaque manner, she, she doesn't elaborate on that. So you need to read the clues in the interviews, or you need to read on a little in her 1999 book where she says, today in the post-Soviet world, privatization is the kingpin of economic restructuring for globalization. Um, a book in which she doesn't um, lose many words um, uh, for um, the post-Soviet, on the post-Soviet world. Um, she doesn't, she discusses it, it, it very briefly. And you can see here that it is a, 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 summer, a summary dismissal um, of the post-Soviet world because basically it's now private, all privatization. And there's a catch-up path, a catch-up development uh, of new liberalization and transition with the West. Um, with all epistemic alternatives, and I think that's implied here, um, gone um, for good. So global theory um, is proceeding without the East, and that's something that has been um, diagnosed um, and critiqued um, by scholars um, from the East, but also others. Um, scholars like Marila Tlastanova, um, who wrote, Can the Post-Soviet Think? Um, and of course, the title is uh, a, a, an allusion to uh, Can the Sub Alton Speak, um, Spiebeck's uh, famous article. Um, and she, uh, she, um, she comes up with the following diagnosis. The situation can be described as a general invisibility of the post-Soviet space and its social scientists and scientists for the rest of the world and the refusal of the global north to accept the post-Soviet scholar in the capacity of a rational subject. So this is the diagnosis from, from which I'd like to start. Um, and one could, of course, ask the question, should the, the East exist in global urban theory? Or might we rather um, be happy without such a category? Um, might it perhaps not um, contribute anything interesting? Might we perhaps just use more universal terms uh, that are not particularly Eastern or that don't um, suggest a difference of the East with uh, the North and the south, south. I would like to answer that question in the affirmative, and I think there's an urgent political imperative to think with the global East, to reinscribe them into the project of global theory making, because that's where they're missing. And for me, thinking global urban theory with the global East means thinking beyond North and South. Um, and this is important because I'm not advocating an, a, an Eastern urban theory um, or, or the East as an end in itself. For me, the global East are a means of progressing towards a more global and a truly global theory that serves the name. 
And in that short statement here, I've highlighted um, a very innocuous word, and that's the preposition with. Uh, and that's because I prefer it to the other preposition, preposition we often see in its place, and that is, of course, the preposition from, theorizing from the South, for example. And I think the with is important here for two reasons. One is because it does not reference a place, um, as, as the from often does, or automatically does. Um, and you can think with the East without necessarily thinking from the East in a, a geographical sense of location. And the second reason is that the with is additive and not exclusive. You can think with the East, but also with other bodies of knowledge. But thinking beyond North and South does not mean um, thinking without them. And that's the other important element here. Um, I've been very inspired by Chari's statement that we need to commit to being with in a world of simultaneous interconnection and ontological difference. In the end, th this is what the, the term or the concept of the global East wants to do. There is the global, which is the interconnection, and then there is the East, which is the difference, the ontological difference, if, if you go with Chachari. So it's, it's, it's a balancing act, perhaps also a somewhat paradoxical one, of both looking at connections um, and, 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 uh, and sameness, but also not losing uh, sight and hold of difference. How could it happen? Um, I want to take some inspiration from uh, um, somebody who wrote about uh, 100 years ago now. Um, it's uh, the Soviet-Russian uh, liter literary criti critic and theorist, uh, Viktor Shlovsky, who wrote a book called The Knight's Move. The knight is the piece uh, in the chess game, uh, which moves as the way that you can see actually on the book cover here. So. Um, and for, for Viktor Shklovsky, he takes the night as a metaphor um, of thinking about how the East moves. And the main, his main idea is that the night can't move straight. The might, night moves straight and then to the side. And for Shklovsky, this is very similar to the idea of um, the East, how the East and an Eastern um, gaze uh, on the world would move. So he says the following, our torturous road is the road of the brave. But what else can we do when we have two eyes and see more than honest pawns or dutifully single-minded kings? So when he says we, I think he refers precisely to the knight, the chess piece, uh, which has two eyes and which sees more for him than the honest pawns or the dutifully single-minded kings. And you can read here an opposition of North and South, yeah? the powerful um, kings um, being the North, the honest pawns, being the South. Um, and for him, um, uh, doing the knight's move is um, taking the road of the brave. Uh, it moves forward and sideways. Um, it's kind of an oblique, a diagonal, a zigzag move um, that reveals the, the play of human freedom vis-a-vis -vis political teleologies and ideologies. Um, and I'm taking inspiration here um, uh, from Svetlana Boim, who used um, Viktor Shklovsky's uh, idea of the night um, to talk about the off-modern. She called the off-modern precisely um, what um, she, she finds in the post-socialist societies, um, an, al an alternative modernity, a parallel modernity that is not quite modern, uh, but also not pre-modern or anti-modern either. So I would, I would stay with that metaphor, and I would just like to take it as, as this, as a metaphor, as being, you know, some, somewhat related, but not quite, as being modern, but off-modern, um, of not having quite the straight um, path that is barred to the night. Um, and take that as an encouragement um, of how thinking with the East can help us think um, still uh, in connection with the North and South, but also beyond North and South, South in global urban theory. And for me, these are also provisional lines of thought and inquiry. So, um, you know, what, what, what you will hear is also, for me, thought and progress that I wanted to share. It's not something that is, um, you, know, you know, finalized and uh, in, in a final form. Um, but uh, I find it important to move beyond lamenting a marginal role of the East, you know, in global theory, uh, towards also an affirmation to change things and to also map out even if tentatively, some concrete ways forward. I would like to map those ways in, 
in three different um, dimensions or three different paths, if you like. Um, how, how thinking with the Eastern global theory, urban theory can do three things. It can broaden geographical imaginations, it can question urban archetypes, and it can diversify theoretical repertoires. And I'll like to speak about each of those a little in turn. About the first one, um, we've seen that the geographical imagination of global urban studies is dichotomous. Um, there is a northern urban imagination, which I think goes back, if you trace the genealogy, uh, which has been done by, by people who were, um, uh, seek to decenter urban theory, uh, to Friedman, John Friedman and his 1986 map of the hierarchy of world cities. Um, and I invite you to, to look here where uh, cities of the former socialist countries are. Uh, basically, they are, they're non-existent. Um, you see the Soviet Union is marked here, but it's marked as an empty space. Um, there's even no mention that between Western Europe, which you can see here on the map, um, and, and the Soviet Union, uh, there were, of course, other countries that, that were between Western Europe and, and the Soviet Union um, that, that don't even appear as the empty placeholder here that, that is the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union here is a kind of a, a case apart. It's not even somewhere in uh, uh, the what he calls the semi-periphery or uh, the periphery. Um, it just, uh, its cities just don't, don't exist. Uh, which of course ignores that uh, cities like Moscow or Warsaw have been world cities um, in uh, a very different system of economy, not a capitalist one, but a socialist one. And um, following up in this northern urban, uh, urban imagination, 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 cities of the East have been scripted as somewhat of backward imitators of Western modernity, of struggling to catch up with Western cities, introducing market economies, democratic governance, modern planning, and therefore as not something particularly interesting to look at. Scholarship on and from the global south, south tries to rectify that imbalance that is evident in the map. Um, and uh, in research project, uh, a small project, I was curious uh, whether that would also uh, imply a move uh, towards including cities from the east um, in urban theory. So um, what we did is um, we looked at some of the, the basic body of knowledge uh, in uh, southern urbanism, and you can see the references that we looked at here. Um, and we did a very simple frequency count of how often uh, certain uh, city names uh, or city names in general um, came up in this body of literature. So just to get an idea roughly of um, <clears throat> what cities we speak of when we speak about this in the South. And this is the, the world map that was created here. Um, Mumbai and Johannesburg come out in front with 70 occurrences in that body of literature. Then you see in the next round with more than 60, Mexico, Sao Paulo, Nairobi, Jakarta. And you see that gradually there is kind of a mental map that is, um, that is drawing itself here um, about the geographies of thinking cities from the south. Then there's Dakar, Cairo, uh, Dubai, and Shanghai. And only then do we have alongside Cape Town and Colombo, also those iconic cities of uh, the north, of New York, Paris, and London. Um, so the interesting thing here is um, that yes, indeed, um, the southern urban imagination manages to displace the centrality of uh, the big northern cities, London, Paris, New York, and others, um, and put other cities in its place. Um, but there's also a very particular geography to this. Um, there's a geography, first of all, um, that the most frequently mentioned cities are those where English travels well or Spanish and French as European colonial languages. And the geography is also obviously that you need to go down until rank 17, that you find the first city of um, the former socialist countries there, uh, which is Moscow. And just uh, ranked just uh, behind Liverpool and Geneva. So the imagination of the South, although it does manage to decenter um, the the places that do we think urban theory from, um, it uh, decenters towards uh, a very particular uh, geography that also has its holes and its silences. 
The second um, way in which I would like to suggest that the East can uh, help us rethink or think beyond um, North and South is in questioning urban archetypes. And if we talk about urban ar ar archetypes, then uh, a typical opposition has been made between, on the one hand, the global city, the quintessential North metropolis, um, relatively rich, located in a network of global flows of capital images, people and policies, as you can see here with Saskia Sassen's cover of the global city. And then um, the quintessential essential southern metropolis, the subaltern megacity, that's marked by, by poverty, by informality, but also on, on the other hand, by diverse resources of collective action, improvisation, and making do in the face of adversity. And so you have those two archetypes that kind of seek to describe also the reaches of the theory that is being made in those places. Um, but then none of these two archetypes resonates much with many cities in the former socialist East. Uh, where state cities cut it every which way, there are alpha world cities and former imperial metropoles such as Moscow and Warsaw. There are subaltern post-colonial cities such as Tbilisi and Dushanbe. And then there's some cities such as Moscow, Belgrade, that could conceivably be discussed as representing both imperial and subaltern elements at the same time. So there's informality, but it's not as prominent as in the Global South. There are command and control functions, um, but they're not as prominent as in the Global North. And in other words, cities of the former Socialist East defy a very easy classification into those um, urban archetypes. Um, and it's precisely through defying this easy classification that they could challenge those archetypes and lead to more nuanced understanding um, uh, of cities um, that does not rely precisely on archetypes to characterize cities in particular places. And the last proposition I would like to make um, is that of uh, thinking with Eastern global urban theory in order to diversify theoretical repertoires. And I think what we've seen in, in recent years is the diagnosis of what could perhaps even be called a standoff between theoretical positions in urban theory. Um, of, on the one hand, Marxian positions of global urban neoliberalism and urbanization, and the post-colonial position of subaltern particularities and specificities. And increasingly, each of those positions are used more as flying banners um, than necessarily for the purpose of asking you know, what novel insights um, can those theoretical positions create? Um, how can they better help us? Uh, can they help us better understand certain urban phenomena? And Eastern cities for me here show the relevance of both theoretical approaches. I think both have been used to a very um, interesting effect uh, in theorizing Eastern cities but also they show the limits of those approaches and the need to go beyond them. So there's a limited reach of theoretical master frames of, on the one hand, the master frame of neoliberalism um, by looking at the rather hybrid economic formations that one often finds with different forms of capitalism on, in, and with the remnants of what some have called still socialism or new patrimonialism and authoritarianism. So there's a, a crossbreeding here um, um, in terms of urban morphologies of land ownership and markets, of infrastructures, of planning and the role of the state in it, um, and so on and so forth. And the other uh, theoretical master frame um, that uh, needs to be challenged is post-colonialism um, because of the very convoluted post-imperial relationships um, that um, exist in the East. Um, that range from subaltern empires, that's a term by uh, Madina Tlistanova, to dual peripheries. The idea being, Tlistanova calls Russia a subaltern empire, um, the idea being that it has both been an empire, uh, but it also is in a subaltern position vis-a-vis -vis Western Europe. And the dual peripheries, um, she calls it the south of the south, uh, basically the former colonies of, um, of uh, Russia or uh, the former member states of the Soviet Union, uh, which she calls uh, dual peripheries because they're the periphery of a subaltern empire. And um, often, of course, the perception is um, that post-colonialism applies only to non-European contexts. And so um, th th this... Uh, 
um, idea of the post-imperial relationship here also complicates the question of where post-colonial theorizing um, can usefully apply. The question of, of course that follows is what theoretical diversification could be envisaged here. Uh, and for me, this is not an issue necessarily of talking about Eastern particularities, but it's a question of where uh, cities of the East offer a particular richness, a varied articulation of social formations. I think very interesting path of uh, working uh, on enriching uh, theoretical approaches have been those on the multiple temporalities and modernities. Uh, and the idea of the global East is precisely to break with a linear narrative of Western modernity uh, and to draw attention to multiple coexistent temporalities and modernities. I think uh, what's very thought provoking is the state economy relationship, which sees very uh, varied forms or um, a queer theory as well, um, in particular, thinking about the idea of how the East are um, somewhere in between North and South, and queer theory precisely also theorizes this in-betweenness. Um, so it could be a very interesting theoretical resource to develop further. And finally, I, I think what we should not forget is that uh, the East is also a, um, um, a breeding ground or a ground of inspiration for politics of alternatives um, in uh, places that are often maligned for democratic backsliding, authoritarian populism, um, <clears throat> and uh, that uh, are often dominated by um, discouraging news about um, authoritarianism and populism um, at the expense of looking at the politics of the street that are taking place, at politics of young people and the politics of the internet which uh, are actually quite encouraging and which could show um, alternative ways of doing urban politics or politics more generally. And to leave that not so much in uh, you know, floating somewhat in, in this abstract space, uh, I'd like to give one example of um, uh, research I've been doing with a colleague, Yelena Trubina, uh, at the University of Yekaterinburg in Russia. Um, and in that research, we've looked at the Boris Yeltsin Presidential Center in Yekaterinburg. This is the building that you can see here. Um, and what we did here is that um, we used um, this case. It is essentially what, what it is, is it's very hard to describe what it is actually. It, it's, it's a very, uh, a, a very multiplex building in its functions, but at its origin and idea, it's a presidential center. Um, modeled somewhat on the idea of presidential centers in the United States, where there is a museum dedicated um, to a former president. And we use that case to challenge the theorization of improvisation in urban theory. And we argued that the case of the center um, provided a very rich resource for theorizing improvisation, uh, partly because of the way it came about. Um, it, there were many unplanned elements, and it actually it is a coincidence that it exists uh, as it does now in the place that it does now in the way that it functions today. And what we did in, in this work is that we looked, um, we contested improvisation um, and, and the two dominant ways of reading improvisation. And those two dominant ways were um, on the one hand seeing improvisation as being on the spur and in the moment. Um, um, and what we did is we, we said that actually, we showed that actually improvisation is a result of both very rigid structures um, that are not um, uh, in flux all the time, but on the other hand, also meeting high uncertainty in flux. So it's a way of navigating between uncertainty on the one hand and rigid, uh, rigidity on the other. Um, and so this way we were trying to theorize between those extremes of seeing improvisation either um, as a celebrated creative practice or uh, as a weapon of the poor or the weak, or the other extreme um, as the privilege of the rich and the powerful um, as bad politics of dodging the rules. Um, and we, uh, under, uh, we underscored that it, it is an ambiguous practice that on the one hand produces very congenial results, um, a presidential center that actually offers space for uh, discussion, for open debate. Um, that is on the one hand funded by the state and therefore top down, but on the other hand has been appropriated by people um, in ways that were not foreseen um, and that are uh, also very exceptional in big cultural centers in Russia. And with this, we wanted also to challenge notions of the East and here of Russia in particular as some kind of authoritarian wasteland with no spaces for an alternative politics. Um, if that was the case, the, the Yeltsin Center would not exist as it does today. 
So this is one way in which we've tried to um, you know, diversify theoretical repertoires um, in a kind of uh, th kind of thinking in between, uh, but also by, sh uh, by showing up um, how there are different uh, political alternatives, political spaces uh, that appear in what from the outside often uh, looks like a, a very homogenous um, uh, authoritarian or populist um, uh, wasteland. That brings me to the question, how can the East exist in global urban theory? I think um, this is a question that is um, for uh, all of us in a way to decide. Um, and the only thing that I can do is um, make a proposal of how to move forward. And I'd like to make the proposal um, in four parts, which are centered around the idea of thinking with the global East. The first word here is thinking. And thinking for me needs two um, qualifiers, two specifications here. Um, first of all, the thinking means establishing a subject position. To be able to speak and to be heard, one needs a place to speak from and with. Uh, so this is the question of recognition uh, that is an important intervention here. But also thinking um, is perhaps less ambitious and theorizing, because doing theory in itself is a, a very academic and a very peculiarly Western way of thinking um, that is subject to many constraints uh, and to many presuppositions of what is theory, who can legitimately do theory. So thinking here opens up the um, playing field to multiple knowledges and to different forms of knowledge, not all of which are necessarily theories. And so we're, by opening up to the thinking, we're more agnostic about the theoretical import of, the, of um, those modes of thinking. The second one is the with. And I've already uh, talked about the with before. Um, the idea is one of being with in a sense of solidarity and valorization of knowledges and thought that is being created with the East. And here, there's no active politics to be engaged in, a politics uh, that one could call a politics of citation, uh, because it, it is precisely by putting forward um, knowledge uh, created uh, in, with, and from the East um, that uh, the global architecture of urban theory will change. So this uh, perhaps also requires then a spirit of decentering or a, a decolonial spirit, if you like, um, that refuses to simply imitate Western theories and scholarship. Uh, but starts from, um, from Eastern vantage points. The global, which is a small g global um, of topological connectedness. Uh, there are multiple ways of being global um, and of being in the world that reach very much beyond this idea of big global cities and command and control centers. And then the East, which I've put here in the plural, um, because they point to the multiple locations beyond the Western European colonial frame and essentially this privileged relationship of North and South. Um, and there are multiple Easts, as I mentioned before, uh, beyond the one that I know best and that I've been mostly basing my arguments on today. Um, but one can certainly think of the Asian Easts, uh, the Middle Eastern Easts, um, and um, many places and societies in the world that escape this relationship between former European colonies and former European colonial powers. But then the East here serves um, also as a concept uh, that is some sort of a third term that urges to move us beyond hemispheric binaries. Uh, and so perhaps much as the queer debate has done for feminist and queer research uh, to open up a space beyond the binaries, the East here points to the multiple in-betweens of North and South. And in so doing, I argue precisely not for an Eastern theory, uh, but for a renewed global or perhaps a more global theory with multiple um, locations uh, that contribute to this um, way of doing urban theory. This, of course, begs the next question. Can the East exist in global urban theory? I have no doubts about that. And I would argue that uh, we need to move from uh, the perception of epistemic collapse to perhaps the opposite uh, perception of epistemic privilege that exists in, exists in the East. So I'm uh, very hopeful about um, the potential for things to change. 
where would I locate this epistemic privilege and why do I come up with that idea that there could be something like this? Well, for one thing, I was inspired by a uh, Romanian sociologist based at the University of Freiburg, Manuela Boatka, who says that the strength of the semi-periphery resides primarily in the cultural and epistemic sphere. So exactly there, where often um, its weakness is located. And by um, uh, a literary theorist and critic, uh, Jacob Mikanowski, who says that the first thing to know about Eastern Europe is that it contains a remarkable concentration of human diversity, which is something that most of us are very aware of, um, but that's something that is um, uh, a strong starting point because diversity is uh, essential for uh, rich and diverse and nuanced theorizing. And it is in direct opposition to what are often external perceptions of uniformity and monotony. So this is a little bit the, you know, the kind of the, the two theorists that, that would, would help us think about this in terms of epistemic privilege, but there are also, they're also precedences. There's the precedence of uh, Chandra Mohanty, a leading figure of third world feminism, who argues that the oppressed can have epistemological privilege. Um, resulting precisely from their unique position and their social struggles. And so she rejects this idea of uh, women in the third world as being passive objects and victims that need help. Um, they say, she says that they have precisely something to say and we have something to learn from them uh, due to their unique position and positionality. And finally, um, Bell Hooks in her book uh, from feminist, th feminist Theory from March into Center. Uh, she reminds us that feminist theory and black feminist theory in particular can move and is moving from march to center. It's something that will not happen in a day, it won't happen tomorrow or next year, but it is um, a common project that needs time and that needs um, commitment. And that brings me to the last question from my talk, will the East exist in global urban theory? I think this question is for all of us to decide. Um, through what some have called an ontological politics, a politics that is being done in intervening into ontology, because if the uh, East will exist, it will, excisely, it will exist precisely because we bring it into existence. And that will also require collective action. Thank you very much for listening, and I'm very much happy to hear any questions, any comments you might have.